Wait, wait till the end. We'll see if there's any applause. OK. Um, OK, so Dimitri did a fabulous job on uh, Europe and on the numbers. So I'm, not, I, I'm actually going to focus elsewhere. I'm going to focus on other parts of the world. And I will talk a bit more conceptually and, and, and less, I suppose, about, um, uh, about uh, policy issues. Because while most of the headlines in the global northern press has been about the flows to, um, uh, to, to Europe uh, and about the, the cuts in the programs in the United States, what's missed is that 85% of the world's refugees uh, are, is in the globe, are in the global south. And Dimitri gave you the list uh, of uh, countries where people come from and hosting countries. And you saw there were a million Somalis and two to three million Afghans and five million Syrians and people recently displaced, not on the list now, from Nigeria, from South Sudan, from the Central African Republic. Almost all of these people stay in the region. Uh, and what has happened, not only do we have the system that is broken down in Europe, as Dimitri uh, so well demonstrated, but uh, the, the, the international refugee regime, which was the pride of the 1950s, it created an agency, UNHCR, and adopted a convention. You, the 1951 Convention on the Status of Refugees, this system is broken. Uh, and uh, my, my, my argument is going to be that it is foundering on contradictions that were there from the start uh, when the convention was adopted, uh, even though they, it, it, it took a while for that uh, to, um, to, to manifest itself. We're now seeing it. I think we, I think we have a police bulletin here. Can we, but, uh, uh, no. Um, uh, and um, you know, Dimitri. Do it. Do it. It, it sounds yeah. like you're trying to do Abu Dhabi. <laughs> okay, we'll see. You know, D Dimitri's last slide said that Europe. I can't do this. OK, so Dimitri's last slide showed, he said, sort of at the end of the road, really, in terms of Europe having any new ideas or any ways to solve this. Um, I'll suggest uh, a range of different uh, possible solutions that may not apply uh, directly to Europe, but that the system really now needs a major overhaul. It needs some new conceptualization. And I want to put this in, in the broader context, because for me, uh, the problem is the fact that uh, this is a system put together for states by states. And we have to start with that recognition of what the refugee regime is about. So looking to states as the main place to solve the problems is likely not to be fruitful. And that's what we've seen in Europe. So then we probably need to look, uh, look elsewhere. My, my thesis is that states have a great responsibility, but very little incentive to make this system uh, work, uh, work better. Let me start with a, uh, just a very brief overview of the, the origins of the refugee uh, regime. Dimitri go gave you the numbers about people displaced during the war. By the time, uh, by, by the late 40s, early 50s, um, there had been 20 or 30 million people displaced in the aftermath of the war. Most had been, gone, most had been repatriated at that point, either through military authorities uh, or by international organizations, precursors to UNHCR. And when UNHCR is created in 1950, there are probably about a million refugees left in Europe. Uh, and uh, there is a recognition that there will be more arrivals from the new Eastern European communist regime. So there was, there was a recognition there will be more coming. But UNHCR is created as a small agency. It's a bunch of lawyers, basically, who are there to hand out documents and work on people's rights and trying to get people to, to join a, a convention. Uh, international protection is the word that comes to the fore at that point, And that's what they are concerned with. And the main message of the convention was not about these global responsibility sharing systems. I'll have a lot to say about that. And that was the last point in, in, in one of Dimitri's slides about Europe's interest in a broader kind of system, if we can get to it. It was rather that the, the Western states had done their job. They had taken back a lot of people, uh, and Eastern states as well, and a lot had been uh, a lot have been repatriated and a lot have been resettled. And the job now is to take the remaining refugees and have them integrate into the societies where they were located. So the 51 Refugee Convention is about local integration. It's about giving people rights so that they can take care of themselves. It's not about citizenship, because it says you're not guaranteed naturalization, but, but you're guaranteed a right to work, a right to education, all sorts of rights that would allow you to make your way uh, 
uh, in, the, in these hosting states. So the main message is to the European uh, hosting states here. What's left out of the convention, and what we're now seeing is the main problem is, there's no right to enter a country to ask for asylum. You're only given the right not to be returned. There's no mechanism for enforcement of rights uh, that are granted in the convention. It's left up to domestic institutions. And there is no general responsibility uh, sharing arrangement, formal structure for making sure that you don't end up with a system where it's mainly the states next to the states in crisis that bear most of the burden uh, of refugee flows. So what happens after the convention is adopted? Uh, Dimitri gave you some of the numbers uh, in Hungary, and then, of course, there are large flows uh, in Africa uh, and Asia. And UNHCR takes over increasingly an assistance role until, to jump forward to today, um, the UNHCR spends about $3 billion uh, a year now, uh, as largely as an assistance um, uh, agency. Today, again, we are seeing what we saw in the 1990s, uh, where there were large flows to the global north, where uh, the global north uh, tends to deflect, to deny, and to return asylum seekers. Uh, as Dimitri said, they want an orderly movement of people where they select people and bring them in, not mass arrivals uh, at the border. So at the United States, we see detention of families uh, at the southwest border because of the Northern Triangle flow. In Australia, we see people deflected to Nauru and Manus Island, and we have the EU-Turkey deal that has dramatically cut the flow uh, from Syria. That's in the global north. In the global south, we've seen a, a massive denial of rights guaranteed uh, by the convention. In most states, refugees are not entitled to work. Less than half uh, the children are in school um, on and on. Now, we could live with the situation, I suppose, of refugees being in camps for a short period of time for emergency care uh, and then going home if, in fact, these are short stays. But what's happened over the last decade or two is that the conflicts continue and people don't go home. And so we've, UNHCR has identified around the world what they call uh, protracted refugee situations, about two dozen of them, uh, meaning uh, populations of 25,000 uh, or more refugees outside their country of origin for five years or more. This has become the rule, not the exception. We live in a world now of large flows, new flows on top of old flows, and old flows not being resolved. And it's led to a situation that I've called in uh, some of the things I've written, the second exile. The first exile being when someone is forced from their home and over an international border. The second exile being when they're in a hosting state, but they're not included in social programs, they're not entitled to work, they don't join the economic system, uh, and they're left in this dramatic state of limbo that goes on and on. Now, in the academic literature, this is sometimes, uh, critical academic literature, this is sometimes described as refugees living in a state of exception and the focus is on refugee camps. Um, I think that overstates the case because, first of all, most refugees don't live in camps. Three quarters of refugees actually don't live there, although that's the iconic image of refugee camps. Most refugees are not in camps, they're in rural settlements or they're in marginal urban uh, areas. But, in f but, but more importantly, uh, there was, uh, I mean, in, in the so-called state of exception, it's an area without law, without rights. In fact, there was a regime of rights created. That's what I've just said. In 1951, we did have the Refugee Convention uh, adopted. And Hannah Arendt, who wrote at the time of the, the drafting of the convention uh, and the creation of the refugee regime, although she wrote about the, the earlier time, she, she said what was uh, what the, the plight of refugees is they, were, they didn't have the right to have rights. They didn't have membership in a society that had to recognize their rights. And she said there was a difference between not having rights at all or having rights and not having them enforced. And I think we're in that latter category now where there are substantial rights and growth of human rights beyond the convention, but they're simply uh, not enforced. Um, things have gone tragically wrong in the refugee regime. And if we're not in a state of exception, then we are clearly in a state of dependence. That is what the international refugee regime has bred for the, for the vast majority of the world's uh, refugees. So I'm gonna talk then about um, uh, I, the principles that I think should undergird uh, a reform, a radical reform of the refugee regime. And it starts with two core values. The first is state responsibility, as I've already uh, uh, said. Uh, and, um, and the second is a notion of refugee agency. I don't mean the refugee agency, UNHCR. I mean agency for refugees. Refugees having control of their lives, having a choice as to where they settle, uh, and being able to rebuild their lives. 
And both these values actually take a quite critical look at humanitarianism as it has evolved. Um, because modern humanitarianism, as practiced, I should say, practiced on refugees, promotes neither a goal of state responsibility or refugee agency. Why? Because what it does is it allows the global north to feel good about their efforts by giving money to take care of people elsewhere. But the way they give money is to put people into states of dependence, not states of self-reliance and robust lives and communities. So humanitarianism is directly res related to this growth of the second uh, exile. Uh, and it uh, denies uh, refugee agency because uh, refugees are people done for. They're not given things that they can do with. Uh, Dimitri mentioned the cash um, uh, movement in Turkey. This follows from a number of different cash experiments around the world. This is the new thinking because it endows people with dignity and choice, and it's a long way away from um, the, the doing to of, of, of humanitarianism. So um, um, I, I think you could say it cynically, but I don't think inaccurately, that the, the view of the system now is that the North basically uh, pays the South to take care of refugees there so that they don't come here, meaning the North. I want to start fresh, and I'm not going to ask what the current legal norms are or trying to make arguments that lawyers make about we just need to expand the definition of refugee by adding this group or that group. I really want to talk about what the principles of protection are that would undergird uh, a moral and reasonable uh, refugee system, and I'll talk about five of them briefly, and then talk about how we might try to think of putting them in place, uh, since they call for a fairly radical reform in a world where there doesn't seem to be much interest in living up to current uh, obligations, much less moving to new thinking about uh, others. So, number one, first principle, principle of safety, and this has two parts to it. The first is rescue, persons fleeing harm need to be protected. And in my mind, that's irrespective of the intent of the inflictor of the harm, whether someone is targeted for a specific persecution. Dimitri's last picture showed people leaving a, a burning uh, house, and that's exactly the right metaphor, it seems to me. Uh, we help people be because they are in danger and are fleeing a dangerous situation. Now, if you take a narrow definition of the refugee definition, you don't get to most of the people in that line. But if we actually look at how the world operates, we actually protect most people, almost all people, who flee danger across lines, whether they're fleeing natural disasters or, or, or long-term climate uh, change and desertification uh, and fa and, uh, that has created a famine. We protect uh, virtually all victims of civil war who flee across a border, are given refugee status, whether or not it comes within the definition. So there hasn't, for the five million Syrian refugees in neighboring country, there hasn't been a single refugee status determination hearing. They're simply declared to be refugees because we think we should be helped. What I'm suggesting is that this norm um, of rescue uh, is really um, um, not that dramatic, that we should be taking in all people. I think we're already doing it. We're just not recognizing we're doing it because we're fixated on the narrow definition uh, of refugee. And so what I would argue is rather than seeing refugees as the, the general case and then we try to add people onto that category, we see instead what I would call, the phrase I'm using, are fleers of necessity, people who are forced across borders as the general case of which refugees are just a special case of particularly targeted people. This, to my mind, the principle of rescue, um, the subpart of the principle of safety of, of the, its rescue implies a right to enter, which is left out of the convention. And this is what the world does. We don't close our borders to people fleeing burning uh, buildings. The North, global north does as a matter of secondary movement, but the global south primarily does not. Now, we've seen this now in Jordan and Turkey and, and, Sir and uh, Lebanon, where the borders have become closed after five million have come out, but that's mainly because of the failure of the rest of the world to participate in a reasonable responsibility sharing arrangement. The second half of the principle of safety is the principle of non-return. This is usually, this is called the right of non-refoulement, the not right to be, the right to be returned. In, for the lawyers, the right of non-return is the linchpin of the refugee system. It's in the convention, it's in our asylum laws. You have, and that is what is seen as the, the central, and then from that, people try to then imply a right to enter, because if you have a right not to be returned, therefore you have, have to have a right to come into the country in order to assert your right not to be returned. I think that gets it precisely backwards. You actually have a right to be rescued, 
And if you have a right, or there's a moral political principle that you should be rescued. And if you're rescued, you can't be returned to the place that you fled because that would defeat the idea of rescue. So the lawyers have turned this around the wrong way, at least as a matter of moral or political principle, it seems to me, with good reason because that's how the convention reads, but we're talking now beyond the convention to a, a decent system of, uh, a full system of refugee protection or protection for fleers of necessity. Principle number two, the principle of inclusion. Once you've rescued people, you've got to begin to restore their lives and help them restore their communities. As I've already suggested, the convention does that by giving people rights of self-reliance through the right to work, right to school, social protection, the right to have access to social benefits. Uh, but our big problem now is, is that they are uh, not enforced. And I must say, in the, the ways that this is talked about now in uh, sort of policy circles, there's a right to self-reliance, which I think is too narrow a conception of what a right of inclusion would mean, or a word I'm using now, right of emplacement. If the harm is displacement, you have a right to be in place, meaning you have a right to be included. You have a right to have the end of the second exile, a set of uh, inclusion. Now, this would have been controversial a few years ago, but increasingly less so. I think that um, uh, it, the line always among the hosting states was we can't let people work. We can't include them in our programs because that'll be competition with our local uh, people. And besides, if we do, uh, it'll look like they're here forever and we think all refugees should go home. What's happened over the last four or five years now in uh, multilateral organizations, UN organizations and development agencies, bilateral development agencies, we're beginning to see plans now of increased development assistance, which is opening up inclusion. So more money may come with a right, uh, right to work for refugees or this, uh, uh, this uh, so, uh, special economic zones being created in Jordan where industries are open, uh, half the uh, employees have to be Syrians and the goods can come to the uh, EU uh, if they're tariff free. These actually aren't working. This, especially economic zones are not working for, for other reasons, but it reflects a change in thinking where inclusion is now on the political agenda in a way it wasn't with the recognition or require a significant aspect, a, a significant movement in the development agencies. And quite interestingly, just two weeks ago, um, there was a declaration of the so-called EGAD states, these are the Horn of Africa states, uh, on behalf of Somali refugees, which talked about a uh, a regional approach to Somalis, which included a right to work. And this is Kenya, something Kenya has signed on to, even though Kenya has said it's time to close the job camp and send everybody home. Principle number three, the right principle of solution. No one should be a refugee forever. Um, in political theory terms, we tend to talk about this as the need to restore membership in political community. Refugee status ends when you've rejoined a political community. And this follows from Hannah Arendt's uh, famous analysis that refugees, who really she equated with, with stateless people, as I said, lack the right to have rights. Her point was it was silly to talk about human rights. That's a meaningless phrase, uh, unenforceable for a person who is not a member of a political community where those rights can be uh, enforced. And it also plays into notions you'll see quite frequently, which I think are wrong, but they're there in uh, writing about refugees that the definition of a refugee is someone who's the metaphor is used, their relationship with the home state has been sundered and those ties need to be put back together again. Under a theory that looks at this membership as solution, the traditional three solutions have been repatriation, resettlement, and local integration. First, I would note the two of these solutions don't actually lead to membership. The right to local integration doesn't automatically produce citizenship in the host country. And as I've said, Article 34 of the Convention says you're not, the state should think about naturalization, but it's not a right. And resettlement, which we think of as the great solution, there are going to be a lot of panels and discussion over the next two days on resettlement, doesn't guarantee you naturalization either. Um, but uh, writers like Jim Hathaway and others say, of course, once you're firmly resettled, then, then your refugee status uh, goes away. This has meant to me that it's time to move beyond what I would call the membership bias in our discussions of solutions and to think about other solutions. Um, so for example, uh, maybe a solution is when uh, international protection is no longer needed. The convention calls for a cessation of refugee status when, you're, uh, when you could go home safely, when you no longer would be persecuted. The grounds for your status have, have ceased. We don't consider that a solution, but that's peculiar, it seems to me. It, it is, we think of it as the end of refugee status. Um, so maybe we could imagine a system where if you're really given a full set of rights, and the right, including the right of non-refoulement, uh, and the cause of 
your flight have gone away, that it's, it's now, uh, th then you're fully incorporated in terms of being able to say that would be um, a solution and perhaps the uh, international community should disengage. Another solution we should be thinking about is prevention, which we don't talk uh, much about in the refugee world. There was a time when refugee scholars wrote about root causes. We gave that up because we couldn't do a damn thing about these conflicts and we realized that was not our strong suit and we left that to others to, uh, to worry about. But of course, prevention of conflict, not prevention of flight, but prevention of conflict ought to be on the agenda as a solution. We define solutions too narrowly because of our focus on membership, because of our focus on states. And that's gonna be a consistent theme through the remainder of my comments here. Fourth principle, principle of mobility. Again, refugee scholars argued about a decade or so ago that forced migration was a violation of the right to remain. There was talk about a human right or the right to remain uh, in your country. The theorists moved away from this when states began to pick this up and say, oh, right to remain, then maybe you should be staying close to your country and we shouldn't be taking you in. You need to be near your place of resettlement. Maybe you shouldn't even move at all. Maybe you should be settled and you should be an IDP, not a refugee, because your right to remain has has gone away, so we stopped talking about a right to remain. But I think it is time to bring the concept of mobility back into a discussion in a slightly different um, way. First of all, the convention guarantees a right of mobility for people recognized as refugees. The convention says anyone recognized as a refugee has a right to move freely within that state. Widely violated with policies of encampment, but it's there. But I want to talk about something more controversial um, than that. I want to talk about thinking about a right of mobility among members of the international refugee regime. When states sign the convention, they've, they've committed themselves to virtually nothing except enforcement of rights which they routinely violate. They don't see themselves as having systemic responsibilities. And I said that goes back to the beginning because the, the purpose of the convention was to give rights of the, to refugees so they could locally integrate. There wasn't the sense that we were forming a group of states that together collectively would solve the refugee pr uh, problem. And that gap has meant we don't have a system of uh, global responsibility sharing. But imagine a world where someone adjudicated a refugee had a right to move to any other member of the regime. It goes back to the, the time of what we used to call the Nansen passports. Friedrich Nansen was the first high commissioner for refugees in the 1920s. And what refugees lacked at that time was any kind of ident identification, any kind of status. And so this international official started handing out passports and they became known as Nansen passports, not issued by any state, but they formed as identification and they formed as a way if you left the country, you could come back in with that passport because you couldn't go to your consular official to get a visa to help you in. Could we imagine a kind of Nansen passport now? I proposed this to Mr. Guterres when he was high commissioner saying we should have Guterres passports. He was not enthusiastic about the idea, <laughs> but that we could have some kind of a passport now um, that some kind of a document that would allow you to move to other states. Think of what that would do for refugee agency. Now I know the immediate answer is that you can't have everyone flow to Germany. Uh, so maybe there could be limits. You could have uh, the EU system of free movement. You can settle elsewhere if you can show you have a job or a means of support or family. Maybe you could have some kind of limits on it, but we ought to be talking about mobility for refugees. Why? Think about this. The fight over movement to Germany from Turkey is either put as you have a right as a refugee to apply for asylum again, even though you've, been a, you've already been deemed a refugee in Turkey. Why should Germany have to, Dimitri was talking about how slow these adjudicate, why should Turkey have to re-adjudicate all these cases? Once you're a refugee for the system, shouldn't you be a refugee, right? Or you're characterized as a migrant, as someone now seeking onward movement. You were in Turkey, why do you have to go elsewhere? You had protection there. If you imagine the regime as a whole of states, then you're a refugee, and then you can choose where you want to move. And this was in the early refugee documents in the 30s, in the conventions. There was a sense that there should be a right to move. There was, it wasn't guaranteed, but it was there for self-reliance purposes. You were able to look in other places for work, and the Nansen passport helped facilitate that to some extent to go take care of yourself, and I think we should, so I think we need to bring this back. It may be that this gets worked best at the at the uh, regional level, I'll say a word about that um, towards uh, the end. Okay, principle number four, uh, the principle uh, of voice. I'm sorry, am I up to five? I think I'm five. You're glad I'm up to five, I know. I'm up to five, principle of voice. And here I wanna keep going back to Hannah Arendt. Um, the problem that Arendt traced was that refugees, because they were outside a political structure, a political system, a political society, lost their voice. 
No one had to pay them any attention. No one had to listen to them. They were not part of a conversation. And it's remained that way, despite the growth of the refugee regime over the last 70 years, 60 years. There still is almost no voice for refugees in the system. It's startling to me, and I say this now having left UNHCR, and I didn't notice it at the time, but there, there are no refugee representatives at the UNHCR Executive Committee. It's all states, and NGOs are given 10 minutes at the end of every session to talk, but no refugees are there in a world of the system's been set up for refugees, right? UNHCR attempts to include refugees in planning from time to time in their local regions, but it's not clear. I've, I've never persuaded that was dramatic. Um, and of course, in a world of second exile, no hosting state is interested in incorporating refugees into political discussions in their states. So we now have a political arrangement in which 20 million people have no political voice, not at home, because they're refugees, not in hosting states, and not in resettlement states. And that violates fundamental norms of democratic governance, it seems to me. So we ought to be thinking about adding refugee representation to Exxon, Exxon Executive Committee. UNHCR should be thinking about organizing refugee representation. You could do this worldwide of finding refugee, re there could be a refugee congress that would elect representatives to XCOM or other, have other kinds of rights. And we ought to be thinking about political rights for long-staying refugees. If people are gonna be left refugees for generations, they ought to have political rights in the societies, local rights, and this is true now increasingly in Europe that, that uh, non-citizens are allowed in local elections uh, the right uh, to vote. If you put these five principles together, um, they mark out, I think, much more responsibility for the international community through rescue and non-return and inclusion and solutions. And they respect and they promote refugee agency. They restore lives, they give mobility, they give voice. Now, as I've said this, I know you're all saying this is so far-fetched, forget it. Um, stick with the more sensible suggestions or what Dimitri was suggesting was there are no sensible lessons left and there's no, there's only Hobson choices, uh, bad, there are only bad choices and probably won't even make the least of the bad choice uh, given the current way forward, at least not uh, in Europe. So let me say, uh, how, do I have 10, 15 minutes, I'm okay? Okay, yeah, I'll be able to get through. Okay, so let me do this in two ways. First I wanna describe what I will call the liberal consensus on the way forward then I want to argue against the liberal consensus and talk about uh, another way to think about this. So, this is, so there have been a set of recommendations now generated by the policy community, by advocates, by academics who play in these circles. I include myself in this group, um, uh, which I will call the liberal consensus. And these are put forward as sensible possible suggestions. They include the following. First of all, it's time to end the system of care and maintenance. This is how UNHCR used to describe its work. It's now used pejoratively. This is what produces the second exile, that we simply give assistance to refugees until they can go home. It's the current brand of humanitarianism, which I think has been debilitating. And we now need this, what's crucial here is the turn to development. I described that very briefly, how the development agencies are coming in and providing job opportunities or working with states to open up uh, a right to work or, or the like. So the entry of the World Bank here is signaled as a major actor of the UN. The World Bank has put aside $2 billion for refugee situations, which is a lot of money uh, for refugees. I mentioned the special economic zones, the right to work for Somali refugees. George Soros is now in a, has announced a fund in September of $500 million to support refugee industry and, and, and work opportunities. So the private sector is a part of this. And it's this, so that's the first, is we need a turn to development which will uh, help incentivize the hosting states to bring people into the system. That's for the global south. For the global north, the liberal consensus um, is basically just simply critical of the global north uh, for what Jim Hathaway calls non-entree policies, detention, what, uh, what um, Australia has done, condemning xenophobia of populist parties, and hoping for better uh, electoral results. But there's not really a program here. There's kind of a, what can we do? They're populists, we gotta back off, et cetera, et cetera. Then the third part is their soft arguments about expanding the protected classes uh, of refugees, uh, people via protocols or new guiding principles like the guiding principles for IDPs. Can we talk about additional categories, but nothing, nothing in terms of hard law. And then the fourth is a call for responsibility, um, uh, responsibility sharing. Uh, and these are usually couched in ways that deny mobility. So the usual argument is we can get more states to cooperate. This argument, Jim Hathaway and Alex Betts, leading scholars on refugees. We can get more states to cooperate if wherever a refugee shows up isn't the place they have to stay. 
In other words, they can go to some place, be adjudicated, and then be, be sent elsewhere, and that'll get states to join a responsibility sharing regime because they won't be burdened simply by the choice of the refugee, as if the choice of the refugee is a bad thing. As you can see that this is, uh, runs counter to my principle uh, of mobility and is put in place there really to end, be a disincentive for abusive claims and to maintain uh, state control uh, and management. These are fairly limited claims. Um, and they're put forward because they think maybe they can succeed if they appeal to the interests of states. And those interests of states are both noble and base, I think. Some noble views, Dimitri talked about how some of the European states really do want to come up with a system that helps refugees. Um, there's some, some not very nice uh, um, interest, as we all know. Um, and the development is there to keep people in the South, not necessarily to guarantee uh, robust lives. Or um, there may be neutral arguments about state interests. That so people point out that if uh, there are potential security risks that happen now when you have uh, refugees forever in these long-staying situations, um, uh, they destabilize hosting states. They may be breeding, breeding grounds for terrorists. Okay. I have two major concerns with the liberal consensus. Um, first, I think appealing. I think there's when refugee advocates appeal to states, telling states that they really don't understand their own interests, I think that's likely not to be persuasive. So when human rights advocates get together with other generals and say, the generals say it's really, uh, this could be a bad thing for security grounds, okay. Um, uh, I, it's just not, it's just not, uh, not gonna work. If, if these were in the state interest, why, the states aren't stupid, why haven't they discovered this uh, already? Particularly because it's not, this is not a very heavy lift. If you looked at the Dimitri's numbers here, yeah, the numbers have gone up and down, but in a world of seven billion people, this is not a lot of people. These are not numbers that can't be managed if we had a responsibility sharing system that really parceled uh, people out. If Lebanon can take a million, the United States probably can take a few more than 10,000, I would think. Uh, and uh, so, um, so, so this would be doable if it were in state interest. So then we're in a world where we're arguing actually against what states perceive as their interest, and that gets very tough. But my problem, my second problem with the liberal consensus is it doesn't ask enough. It takes the existing system as given, and it seeks reforms within it. It appeals to our moral intuitions, the best traditions of liberal states, and then says this is the best we can accept in the current context. I don't think it will improve things. This was Dimitri's last slide. We're left with a bunch of hops and choices if you stay within the existing system and appeal to the interests of states. It may improve the lives of human beings if we get more resettlement and a little bit more money on people. I'm not saying not. But this liberal viewpoint does nothing about systems of non-entree, does nothing about non-enforcement of rights. It doesn't create a robust system of formal, uh, uh, of burden sharing. As I said, it mentions, uh, uh, I've already said it, it restricts refugee mobility. So the principles I've suggested have supported, I think, a much more fundamental reform issue that will, will actually go to doing something about the system. So how do we get there? I mean, if it's gonna be, if we can't appeal to the interests of states. You know, I'm reminded, one of my favorite cartoons of, uh, in the New Yorker was a, uh, a peasant who has shown up in a uh, bedraggled peasant, uh, shown up before the king, asking for help from the king, and the, and the caption is the king saying, I can't solve your problem. I, I am your problem. <laughs> and and I, I, I think in some ways that's what we have. The ref we can't go to states to solve the problem of the refugee system because states are the problem in the refugee system. States create refugees. States keep refugees out. States impoverish refugees when they're hosted. And this is a hard line for policy, guys, because we, me, I'm included, Anne, and others are sort of used to thinking we can just move states along and make them a little more more decent, and I think I'm coming to different conclusions. So if we can't simply appeal to the interests of states or the goodwill of states, what can we do? Here I'll conclude in just five minutes. Um, first, there's an internal game that can be played. We can work lower down in the system. I know that may sound odd, what I'm suggesting here, but again, because the numbers actually are quite small in a global world, um, there are things that can be done at lower levels where you have parts of governments that do believe in the mission of protecting refugees. And here I will look at Ann Richard, who ran uh, PRM as a, as, as a moral agent for five years within a set of political constraints. But there were things that could be worked at that level because the numbers weren't so big that you could do stuff that didn't always get the uh, attract heightened political uh, attention. And there are 
the, their ideas entrepreneurs and people very skilled. I put Dimitri at the top of this list of going to people who head ministries and other places and suggesting policies that can be adopted uh, at, a, at a slightly lower level down than the prime minister's office that can make a big difference. So you can even work within the state system by, by understanding that states are fragmented institutions and other parts of states have other, other interests. Secondly, you could work with other political institutions. At the supranational level, supranational level, you can think about regional arrangements. I talked to you about the Somalia um, uh, agreement uh, that was just reached in, in Nairobi. Um, ECOWAS uh, allows movement of uh, workers through uh, Western Africa. Mercosur is moving towards move mobility for workers in, in, Latin, in, uh, in, South Af in South America. So it may well be that it's, it's possible to achieve political results at the regional level, even if in a state at the UN level you're not going to get a new convention. And then you can also work at the subnational level. Cities are much more open to refugee, protecting refugees. We've seen this, of course, most recently in the sanctuary city declaration, so those, that, that mainly goes for un, undocumented migrants in the US, but cities are more open to working with refugees than states might be, and there may be ways to build alliances with cities. Okay, so that's internal, and then working with different political institutions, and lastly here, um, externally. The problem is states have to be held accountable to the commitments they have made, the system they've created, and the failures that it has led to. They need to be challenged. Um, they have to recognize they have regime responsibilities. Now, how do you do that? Here are a couple of ideas. One is litigation. Um, Kenya announced it was closing to Dobbin, everybody had to go home, and lawyers went into a court in Nairobi, and a, and a court in Nairobi said, no, we're not closing to Dobbin. Now, that may be reversed on appeal, but it's remarkable how that, you read that opinion next to the Washington opinion, the, the, Was the state of Washington district court opinion, and they both said the following. These things are judged by our constitutions, and two, you can't simply cite security and think you're gonna win, you're gonna have to show us some reasons, in both cases. So courts can play a role here. They played a role in Malaysia on refugee rights, in Ecuador, uh, in Australia. There's now an ICC complaint that has been filed with prosecutors uh, alleging that Australia is committing crimes against humanity and its policies, and I mentioned the US, and we'll see about the cases challenging the Turkey uh, deal in the EU as those work through the system. So lawsuits. Secondly, accountability for perpetrators. You know, I remember Mr. Guterres when he was High Commissioner of Refugees at an Excom meeting saying, you have two men, two men in, in uh, South Sudan, Salva Kiir and Rafe, uh, Rafe, um, Rafe Mashar, Mashar uh, who got into a personal dispute that has led to the displacement of three million people and deaths of tens of thousands and no impunity. In fact, the existence of the, uh, I mean, total impunity, impunity no, no prosecution. The existence, of the, the existence of the humanitarian world, in fact, makes their lives easier because if they know if they force people out of the system, out of their country or even within, the humanitarian community will pick up the pieces. And so there needs to be serious thinking, I think, about um, ICC jurisdiction for people who cause massive flows uh, of migrants. Lastly, my last point here, and the main way this will work, is through politics. What's happened here is that, that uh, largely the ground has been ceded to populist parties, and so people wring their hands saying, oh, the populists will never be able to beat them. What are we going to do? What are we going to do? We need to sharpen a political narrative. I I'm just amazed. I'm thinking now about Syrian refugees in this country. So when 800,000 Cubans <coughs> came to the United States, they were welcomed as people fleeing our enemies. Now with Mr. Trump having declared that Assad is finally an enemy of the United States, and they're also fleeing ISIS, why aren't Syrian refugees like Cubans? People that we should welcome with open arms because they're fleeing our enemies. We've gotta change this narrative, reclaim the word refugee. And then secondly, we need to organize. The, the spontaneous movements uh, at these airports were incredible. They had an impact on what the president did. 160,000 people marched on the streets of Spain demanding more refugees come into Spain about a month ago. And we, and we need to think about some um, refugees themselves as part of refugee agency undertaking political activity. I know this sounds strange, but we know in Southern California, the Justice for Janitors movement of a decade ago and undocumented workers got together and started to uh, assert their rights. We need to press for refugee representation in, in executive committee and think about what a transnational refugee movement of politics might look like given now the technological possibilities. So concluding comment here, you know, we, we actually tried to take the politics out of the refugee system. 
The idea was it didn't matter where you fled from, you were entitled to protection. That was a good thing. It was problematic, but this became problematic, it seems to me, when with a humanitarianism that then created a second exile, and humanitarianism was seen as non, non-political, so that's what we could get, uh, that we, that's what uh, people would get behind. So now, when you see the refugee cause talked about you know, around the world, and you get a million emails, it's always donate money so that someone can go to school, not so that refugees can have rights, so that this situation can be solved. To take this to the point about states is, look, the self-interest of states is defined by the politics of those states. What that means is we all have a potential role in fixing this system because we can all be political players in our countries to help fix a regime that has left, uh, that has served uh, so poorly so many for so long. Thank you.